What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Mindset Podcast. Today, we are joined by Mark Llorente, who is the Chief Administrative Officer of CareMax, just recently promoted or given that position, I believe. We'll get into it now in a second. But uh, Mark is not only a phenomenal person, but a great leader within our community. And that is, of course, Miami-Dade County. Uh, he's everywhere. You know, you open LinkedIn and he pops up on some kind of interview and some kind of TV. And we just we're like, man, we really got to have to have Mark on, share his wisdom, his knowledge, his ex- expertise with all of our young professional listeners. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, definitely hope to live up to the expectation. Yeah, definitely. So let's go ahead and get started. And this is probably my favorite part, Gabe and I, our favorite part, and that is our lightning round of warm-up questions. <laughs> so before we get to the fun, fun stuff of getting to know you and, and what you do and, and you know your wisdom, uh, we'll first start with this really interesting question Gabe and I prepared for you. And it's, you know, in a hypothetical world, say you're independently wealthy. You don't have to work for money ever again. Um, what would you do with your time if you money is not a problem? You know, it's one of those hypothetical questions. I think all of us, you know, when you play the lottery, if you ever play the lottery, the Powerball rolls around. There's someone who just won $1.5 yep. billion dollars or whatever. And you're like, you know, how great would yeah. it be? <laughs> Um, I think about, I think about it periodically in those instances. And it's interesting because I don't know the answer. And, and I, I think there's a few ways that I can answer it. The first way is the type of personality that I have, I need to be producing. I need to be driving value, creating value, optimizing value all the time, whether I'm working for free, working for passion, working for fun, um, or working for money. I have to be producing something. I, I could never not be doing that, or at least I can't see that in the foreseeable future. Um, so that's kind of the boring answer, which is I don't. I, I frankly don't know, you know, what I would do if I was to say I absolutely have no choice and it, it has to happen. Um, there would have to be a few different things that I would do that would be components of my that would make up my whole life. So. Um, Part of it is competitiveness and ha- would have to do with something physical. So I would have to be pushing myself day in and day out to 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 strive for some physical aspiration or achievement. And by that, I mean in, in sports or, or at the gym or, or running or marathons or CrossFit or w- whatever it is, it would have to be something physical. As a lifelong athlete, uh, I often say that I'm still an athlete. I just, ha- I don't have a sport anymore, um, but that, that, that DNA, it's, it's embedded in my DNA. So I, I've never lost that. Uh, I would want to do something tied to my passion. Um, and, and I'm not even talking about family and then I'll get, I'll leave the best for last, which is, which is family. Uh, so something sure. tied to my passion, which is community engagement, involvement, um, getting very, uh, immersed in organizations that, um, I believe in, uh, for causes that I very much believe in, uh, with values that are aligned with mine. Um, and, and working with amazing people that I have fun working with. And then I would say most importantly, um, it would be being as involved as I possibly can be in the lives of my family, my immediate family, uh, most importantly, my wife and kids, um, as someone who's traveled extensively and commuted for the last year to and from Miami prior to having relocated back to Miami, uh, just recently, um, there's a lot of time I've spent away and. I may not be able to make up for those moments, but I would want to seed the future, um, making sure that my kids and and my wife have all the attention I could be. Yeah, that's, I love that. It's, you know, the, the conversation of money is an interesting one, right? And I often usually say like the, the money only gives you time, right? If you really want to put it into perspective, because you can hire a nanny to take care of your kids. You can hire someone to manage your company. You can, you can, your the resources are endless so you can get your time back. And I think that's so interesting that you said that about your family. And it's so true. And so many people that I know today, that's may like this, this scenario is very real for them and they still maybe neglect that family aspect or that time. But I think it's so interesting. And I think we might've asked this maybe once or twice in another podcast and Anthony knows this, and this has nothing to do with my profession whatsoever. But for some reason, I've always wanted to kind of build out like almost like an Airbnb or like a like a, a like an a-frame community in like joshua tree california somewhere like in a desert like there's just something about that that just like drives me and it's like 
the hospitality in me like really loves that aspect of and that business is so interesting to me I'm, I'll, I'll scroll on youtube for hours just like looking at like airbnb tours and like these different amazing homes and stuff so that's probably what i would do if i had to if i had to say like that was that would be like my job right like i would put forth some money and some capital into something like that but ditto to all the things that you said uh, you know again as being a former athlete and a current athlete to to kind of um piggyback on what you said um, I think a lot of us, once we maybe get out of that high school or even college um, season of our lives, we may neglect the physical aspect or the athlete in us. Um, and I think it's so important to really regain that because this year I've recently started back up in my re like workout routine and I just feel so much better. I feel so much clearer. I feel so much more present. Um, and I feel like that there could be so many people that are already doing so well. I can't even imagine where they would be if uh they had that in their life so i think that was an amazing answer thank you and i didn't mention vacation and and travel and all that good stuff that's like bonus but i i definitely want to spend some time traveling the world and and again with family uh being able to, to 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 have them explore actually to explore the world together um that would mm -hmm. be really for sure Awesome. Well, that's that's question one. We're on to question two of our little lightning round uh, before we get into the meat of things. This one's going to be an interesting one, too. Um, and this one is, what is one thing that most people or anyone um, don't like doesn't know about you? Well, there's a lot of things people don't know about me. I, don't know. <laughs> uh, I would say a, kind of a lighthearted, funny one. For those that don't didn't know me as a kid, um, I was... And I'm going to date myself with this word, but I was a husky child. Uh, and Man. by that, I mean, I was re on the, on the rounder side of, of the spectrum. Um, husky is a word that is, is ingrained in my psyche because that was the size of pants that you would have to wear. Um, if you exceeded a certain, uh, threshold based on your height. So it was wider waist and shorter length um Great. and uh, being someone who's so active and 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 has been an athlete for you know for most of my life um i think most people would be surprised by that um but that's that's very real i my my worst time in the year was going to get fitted for school uniforms because you know i it was a it was a gut check on literally and figuratively on uh on where i was at and what range i was in interesting well there you know the, the secret's out now everybody knows it <laughs> So you you know and now everybody knows if you were about... friends with my mom you knew that. There you go. Ago. So <laughs> everyone knew that. So I love it. I love it. Well, awesome, Mark. Um, so tell us a little bit about you. I know uh, you started your role as chief administrative officer for CareMax. You've been on the administrative side of um, of medical and, and healthcare and all that good stuff uh, throughout your career. I would say. Uh, I know you you got your start in uh, UF, where I'm actually at right now. I'm my senior at the University of Florida uh, College of Warrington Business School here, as I know you were as well. And then you went on to get your MBA at UM. Uh, walk us through a little bit of your journey of how you got to be where you are today. I know you just mentioned recently you, you spent some time in Texas, but you're born and raised in Miami. So you have a very uh, colored resume and, and uh, very interesting past. Why don't you share with us a little bit of of how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so I think I'll start by saying Steve Jobs' uh, Stanford speech, commencement speech said, yep, you can only connect the dots looking backward. You can't connect the dots looking forward. And I, I disagree with the forward part slightly, um, but I absolutely agree that the dots start to get much more clear in hindsight when you're looking backward. Um, and I wish I had learned that earlier on in my life's uh, and in my career, especially because I wouldn't have put so much weight, uh, in making the perfect choice, right? Everyone wants to make the perfect choice. You want to pick the perfect career or you want to be perfectly happy and you want to have it perfectly. Um, and none of that happens the way you plan it. Right. And so when I graduated from us, um, I didn't have the full fledged plan. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to be. I didn't know exactly the course I wanted to go down. And I, I felt like I was, I had the short end of the stick relative to a lot of folks that I knew who went on to law school and had these futures and plans and they knew the next three years what they were going to be doing. And I had no idea what I'd be doing in the next year. 
Um, and that, what I realized back then was when you're starting with such a vast universe of opportunities, which I was blessed to have, the biggest step is to start to get momentum and start moving down a path. Once you start moving down a path, the field gets narrower and you start figuring out, is this a door? Is this a road? that I enjoy traveling on or do I want to pick another one? Because yeah, I figured out this isn't the right one for me. Um, so I think I realized pretty quickly that being willing to make the mistake or to learn what I didn't want to do was almost more important than trying to figure out what I did want to do. Um, and, and, and so that's kind of the first stage of my evolution was that kind of awakening. Um, what I'd say more than that, though, is now in, retros in retrospect, looking back, a large part of why I've had the opportunity and the benefit of, you know, living a great life and moving multiple times and living in great places is because I was willing to take chances, get it wrong, um, and understand that it, that may not be the end, the end, the end road for me and understand that the combination of all those things now in retrospect, looking back all those different unique experiences, all the life experiences, all the career experiences, having a highly diverse career, which again, I used to joke with friends. If you looked at it and you tried to plot it on a, on a graph, it would just look like this career changes and moving different industries and starting over and going back to grad school and all these things. Now looking back, it, it's a much flatter line and it has a much more uh, steep arc. Um, I didn't see that as I was going through it. So, you know, I started with the stating that I wasn't sure where I wanted to go, and what I wanted to do. And I started down a path, figured out I didn't want to be in certain places. And I started to narrow. I always thought about going to grad school. Uh, to me, that was something that I really wanted to do. Um, but again, if you come from a family of all lawyers, predominantly lawyers or doctors or whatever other profession that's kind of designated and, and you have a track schooling wise that you go down when you mentioned you want to go back to do grad school and MBA and it's like, well, great. That's what's that going to do for you? Uh, cause it's so broad. Um, I did it anyways, because it's something that I really wanted to do. And, and I, I ended up going to work at FedEx, um, in, in more of a logistics role, uh, in an engineering group, which I had no background in. And I often joke that the, the hiring manager who brought me in, um, really was someone who took a chance because she should never have hired. I, I did not have the technical skill set or aptitude to be, to take on a role. But what it did for me was it, it allowed me to take on something in an area of business that I had never been exposed to learn, um, adapt, adjust, and get really comfortable with putting myself in a hard position with being uncomfortable. Um, and so that then led to an opportunity at Miami Children's, now Nicholas Children's. From there, I, I was presented with the opportunity to move to Boston and join Boston Children's. Um, my wife thankfully agreed to to take on that journey. And then I was presented with an opportunity at Stewart Healthcare. We moved it. We I changed to Stewart Healthcare very shortly thereafter, corporate headquarters relocated to Dallas. So we moved to Dallas, um, where we just moved back, I guess, four or five months ago. Um, and I think just to kind of summarize the, the moral of the story, at least of what's been true in my career has been, um, saying yes, when the opportunities come, fight that instinct, which is that pit of your stomach. There's no way I could do this. I don't know if it's the right thing. If you can overcome that and just say yes and commit to doing it, the rest will take care of itself. Um, obviously, you got to put in the work and you got to put in the time. But but for me, it's been creating opportunities and or when the opportunity presents itself, taking it. Um, that's absolutely been kind of my my the underpinning of my professional career. Yeah, Mark, and you said something right now, you know, you said creating opportunities, and I think that's so key, and we've talked about it on previous podcasts, um, about how people might be just waiting around for the opportunity to kind of come up, and you have the ability, we have the ability as individuals to create that opportunity, to go out and ask someone that we might, you know, seek, out, seek after or look up to, hey, like, I want to know what you're up to, I want to know 
you know, how you got there? Like, what do you, what, what would you suggest? Like, how do I, how can I connect with this person? Like just being able to be that person and creating opportunities um, is so important. And I, I want to even take it a little bit further back when you were mentioning in the beginning about making perfect decisions. And I think that's so important because especially people our age, you know, our listeners, they're so hung up on making that perfect decision. Oh my God, am I going to get this perfect job? Am I going to go to the school that I'm supposed to go to? Am I going to, you know, get the perfect spouse or the perfect husband? And it's like a lot of people that Anthony and I even know, they they don't even make a decision at all because they can't decide on the perfect choice. And, you know, a big motto that Anthony and I really, you know, kind of a mantra that we hold on this podcast is fail forward. Yep. And we, you know, we almost like, go towards failure yeah. like you know head and first I, and i i you know? i absolutely i could not more emphatically uh relate to that point i, I uh, indecision is a decision not yep. making a choice is uh, a choice um and and i think again our instincts our our our, our brains we are wired to protect ourselves from uncomfortable things that's just a fact right? It's, it's science over putting yeah. yourself in a position where you get used to figuring out a way to overcome that for me has been absolutely critical. It's not always work. It doesn't mean I haven't failed. It doesn't mean I haven't, you know, had to, had to learn the hard way. But again, those are the life lessons you learn that create the opportunities and or prepare you for the next phase of your life. And now come full circle. You know, I I'm back in Miami with a group of guys yeah. doing some pretty amazing stuff. We just acquired a big piece of my former company's business. Fair. Now, again, hindsight, looking back, it's everything has come full circle. I couldn't predict it seven years ago when we left Miami. Um, but you got to be willing to leave. In my case, I had to have been willing to leave. And, and when it's not just leave. I had to have been willing not to come back, right? Because mm-hmm. once you open that door, an opportunity takes you. You have no idea where you're going to, where you're going to end up. Um, yeah. So that's, that's really been. I love the fail forward um, mentality because it's it's absolutely the way I would uh, categorize my my professional career as well. Now, Mark, I want to take it back to something you said. You you mentioned that this person from FedEx, you know, gave you an opportunity when really maybe they shouldn't have, right? Maybe you weren't the most qualified person. I think is what you were going with. So, so the the question is like, how how can someone? position themselves in such a way like you did maybe not at the moment being qualified for that specific position but still being in the position where somebody believes in you someone takes a bet hey that girl that guy over there he might not have it right now but he's something special let's bet on that person how what what tangible things can people do to be in that position uh where people can take bets on them when they're really early in their career because i feel like a lot of us are in that position right now where we're kind of trying to figure out what am i going to do what is this i'm not I don't have experience, but everybody's asking for five years of experience and I don't have, how do you, how do you get in the room? So I think, uh, look, it's the, it's an, it's, it's more art than science, right? That's yeah. fact number one, at least as, it, as I would highlight it. Um, I was blessed very early on to not have, um, any misgivings or any apprehension about reaching out and asking for uh for a meeting um asking someone who i aspired to be like who i hadn't talked to in 25 years we our families know each other to reach out hey i'd love to hear what you're doing how did you exactly what you guys are doing how did you how did you get to where you you know the the aspirational story picking folks that i i wanted to mirror um that i aspired to be like career-wise I, I did. I started doing that very, very early on. That's how the opportunity at FedEx came about. Um, and 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 I'll tell you the story of FedEx. Is it's I say it, it's very funny. It's actually a really funny story. Um, I was interviewing for a role, um, and I went into FedEx. And FedEx, uh, it was a corporate role in the Latin American Caribbean office here in Miami, and. It was a panel interview. So FedEx puts you through a pretty rigorous day. At least they did back then of interviews. You do individual interviews, then you do a panel interview. And the panel interview had uh, the marketing leader, the finance leader, and the engineering. And they're doing the panel. And we go through this entire process panel-wise. And I am I was trying to be as much myself as possible, but you're trying to engage and, and obviously say the right perfect thing. 
um, one of the, the engineering manager at the end of the, the panel interview came in to the room that they had me waiting in for my next round of interviews. And we just started talking and she, we just hit it off. We, we connected. Right. Um, and that was the end of it. Uh, a couple of days later, I was, I was made an offer. I turned it down for the role that I was applying for. Um, and I, and this is where the follow up follow through the details matter. Uh, I sent all of the panel, the, the finance manager and the, the engineering manager, a thank you note saying, Listen, I'm, I'm sorry it didn't work out. I, I really appreciate meeting with you. I really appreciated meeting you and I appreciate the time uh, you spent. I look forward to, you know, keeping in touch, blah, blah, blah. And she responded within five minutes, called me right away and said, I want to hire you. And I didn't even know she had an opening, right? It, we didn't, we didn't talk about it. Within, that was at nine in the morning. By noon, I had a signed offer letter. Uh, I didn't even know what the rule was. I didn't know anything about the department. I didn't know, but. It was that connection, establishing that connection, finding folks like that who believe in you. Um, same thing happened in Miami Children's. When I was called, it was being called by the, the leader of the organization at the time saying, I want to bring you in. Um, creating those type of opportunities, creating lasting relationships with people that are going to help guide you. Um, I was at Boston Children's and I had a great relationship with somebody who had just left the organization. And she was the one who introduced me to the folks at Steward um, because she said, I want you to meet these folks. It's That's the way it always ends up working, at least has been the case in my experience. And then ultimately, you've got to follow through, right? I mean, that, that just opens the door. But when you're given the opportunity, again, as an athlete and the way I view myself in the world is a relentless pursuit for excellence. I may not be better than you, but you're not going to outwork me. I'll outwork anyone, right? And that mindset is so critically important. And I look for that even in the people that I bring on to the team. Um, I will take attitude over aptitude, technical proficiency any day of the week and twice on Sunday. Um, cause I could teach the technical part that that's fairly straightforward training. One. It's the attitude. It's the, 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 the way someone is wired. Um, and you can spot that from a mile away. And when you see it and you find it, for all of you that are out there thinking that's me, I promise you that someone will see it. You just have to get in front of enough people for someone to see it. So again, going back to the moral of the story, engage, connect, talk to people, tell them what you want to do, ask them about what they did, ask them about how they view the world and how they should, how they would do it if they were you. Once someone is invested in giving you that guidance, they're invested in your success. They don't know it yet, but they are they are investing in your in your success because they're giving you that guidance. And so at that point, they want to help you along in the journey and they often come back and do. Yeah, Mark, I think I think that's so good. You said so many things that I want to get back to, but one in particular was when you were saying that you at an early age, and this is really what Anthony and I are trying to adopt now in our in our early careers, like literally talking to our friends dads that might be in a position that we might want to be in like like what I did. without being out like for what I did. yeah with the father exactly like just just to, like no 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 barrier like nothing like just bluntly hey you can totally reject me right now but i'm gonna ask anyway i'm gonna shoot my shot and i i was told once you know from my middle school teacher and i'll never forget this and she said if you don't ask they will never tell and it's as simple as that. And I, I know, and, you know, I'm speaking for myself here. I'm sure Anthony has, has had his own experiences. But when I ask someone for help or just advice or, hey, do you mind, you know, jumping on a phone call? I just have something to, I really want to ask you um, to we'll take five minutes. Like 99% of the chance, percent of the time, that person will say yes, because people are actually willing. Right. Like there's there's hope in the world. People are willing to actually say yes and, and help uh, younger generations. And, you know, I like to say that the younger generation isn't the future. We're the now. Right, we're the ones changing the industry. We're the ones changing the economy. We're the ones changing the way people do business. We're the ones changing, you know, doing things. And I think even the older generations are the ones that are maybe you know heading into retirement. They're willing to invest their time, and we've seen it with this podcast, you know, within itself. Where this episode might be episode like ninety eight, ninety nine. We're Thank we're you. nearing a hundred, and we had ninety eight people say yes. I think that's that's pretty good odds. Maybe we had probably what like one hundred and fifty people say no, or out of the 150, 99 said yes, like 
there's always going to be rejection. And I think that's a huge lesson for myself, not only, but for our listeners as well, is just to like, just go for it. You know, like for all our Miami listeners, like without Bena, like don't care like what people say, what I, you know, what people are going to, to, to talk about you later, like just go for it. And I think that's such a huge lesson. And really what we're trying to ingrain in our listeners is what you, know, the mentality that you had at your young age when you started your career about doing that, because I, I can't imagine having not done that even in my early on career, like where I would be right now. Yeah, so and, I think look, that's you, so you're huge. not. And, and my, in my experience, the, the relationships that you forge is really what's going to dictate so much of what happens, putting aside performance and, and all those things that are important. You have to know the business. You have to learn a business. You have to show that you can materially move and need all those things. But the relationship part is so critically important. Um, it's what will open the door and it may not keep the door open. That's where you have to, you know, show the, your merit, right? You have to prove yourself. But what I've learned is that oftentimes those folks that you may have overlooked for providing you with the guidance and investing in you, in you or what have you end up being the most impactful ones. And those who you thought for sure you could bank on, uh, their influence, their help, their guidance, whatever, uh, they don't necessarily pan out the way you thought it. The point is you have a vision in your head. And once you start down the path, things are going to change. It's going to be different than what you thought. And there are going to be people that play a role in your life that you could never have forecasted a year prior, two years prior, five years prior. Uh, at the end, the story that it'll tell about your life, it, it'll be a pretty fascinating story. Uh, yeah, and that's that, the way that... I, I try to talk about life and about career. And it's, it's, you're, you're creating the story of your life, right? Don't yeah. let someone create it for you. Create it. Take, take part, take ownership of it. Yeah. Own it. Uh, yeah. My wife and I, when we left to Boston, she had never le left, lived outside of Miami. And so it was a, it was, and we were pregnant with our second kid and it was, timing was not right. It was one of those situations where when I talk about pit of your stomach, like we should say no and stay home base because it's comfortable and good now. Um, and we had a great life career wise and all that. And we decided to do it. Um, we had talked about a vision of the future where at some point down the road, we would have pictures of our kids on the walls, you know, a snow day, um, where you're snow day and you can't go anywhere. You can't go to work and you're just playing in the snow about Martha's vineyard and doing vacations and all, all, all of the, about the Red Sox and taking our yep. two sons at the time. Uh, now we have a baby girl as well. Um, to the, their first baseball game being a Red Sox game. Like, how cool would that be? We lived all of that. We actually have those pictures on the wall. Um, that gave me a real sense of thinking about my trajectory, my life, as me being the author. I'm not a character. I'm the author. I'm writing it. So I'm going to write it. Um, and, and it gave me much more of a sense of empowerment than I think I ever felt uh, in my career or in, or in my life up until that. Mm. So beautiful. Uh, you know, it, I, I aspire to also, as I'm currently writing my own book and, and you know, of, of this journey called life that I'm, I make sure that I'm also the author of that book. And I tell my story just the same way you're doing it, Morgan. It's so beautiful the way you're sharing your story and it's authentic to who you are, right? You take a look at your social media, uh, anything out there of you and they, it, it's the same person. You're the same person that you are now and on social media. And it's beautiful the way um, you're teaching your your kids to also be like that and aspire to be more. And not only to be more, but to serve others along the way. And I think that's something you do so well and kind of shifting gears towards that. that topic. You'd be surprised, Mark, how much, how much research we've done on you and how much we know about you. Although this is the first time we actually get to see each other face to face uh, through the laptop. But one of the things that really... Um, I really, really that I admire about you, Mark, that I took note of, and I told Gabe about this earlier. Uh, you talk a lot in the videos that I've seen and, and your posts and your engagement online. Yeah. You pride yourself a lot on making your customers feel special at CareMax. You celebrate birthdays. I don't know who's, I think a hundred year birthday was recently mm -hmm. or 102, something like that. And, and you celebrated them and made them feel uh, like they're the only person in this world. And you do it often with your customers. And you know, this is not family. These are your customers, but you make them feel like family. At least that's the perception I get from the way that you do your job. 
how do you do that? How do you, what, what kind of things, what kind of mindset do you have to, to be so authentic, so real and so loving towards these people that are clients of CareMax? Cause that, that's one thing that I, um, really, uh, tip my hat off to for that. Oh, thank you. So look, I think authenticity is by definition, authentic. You can't make it up. Um, and it's the sincerity how you carry yourself, how you consistently carry yourself. When the camera is on and when the lights are on and when the lights are off and the camera is off, if you're the same person consistently um, who values people, and by that, there's no distinction between children and adults and men and women and team members who are employed by CareMax or colleagues who are at the same level as you or patients. Um, you know, to me, it's incredibly important to make sure that the authenticity of who we are and how much we care and value the 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 folks who entrust us with their health and well being to to help steer and manage them uh, through the complexity of of a healthcare journey, and especially as you age and you don't remember as much and and you may not have the support that you had that you used to have, you may not be able to drive anymore. Me, more chronic conditions and comorbidities that, you know, things tend to be harder and they're getting progressively harder as your age starts to, uh, in the natural course of life, take shape. Being entrusted with that, uh, with that position of being a steward, um, for, to help them through and navigate their lives is something that I take a lot of pride in. I think a lot of us, uh, across the organization do. I, I always see myself in any role. Um, being the biggest advocate for the folks that I am responsible uh, for and have a responsibility for. And I look at that as everyone across the organization. I don't care if it's someone who reports to me directly. I don't care if it's someone who's above me or someone who's below me. Uh, the the desire to want to have a positive impact on on their lives and to be there for them and to to care about them, that resonates with people. And I promise you that if you carry that trait and it's real and it's authentic, it'll pay itself over in spades a hundred times over. It's not something you have to try very hard for, but I can tell you from my experience in the corporate world over almost 20 years, it is sorely lacking. So if you have it, you're the outlier. Magnified a thousand times over. All you have to do is be it and be it consistently. Um, follow yes. through on your word and, and lead um, and be led. Uh, so, so for me, that's, again, I don't distinguish between if it's a patient of ours or if it's a team member of ours, if it's someone, um, who we get to engage and interact with, and I have the opportunity to, to, to play a role in, um, their health and well-being, their success, I'm going to take advantage. Um, and, and I, I, I have to, and I must, um, at least highlight our team because it's not me. This is a team the folks who are like-minded who have a vision and a passion for what we do and so the celebrating centigenarians because it was such a centigenarian day that was our human experience team who's looking for ways to you know impact very authentically the lives of our of our team members and our members our patients uh proactively we have senior proms at our centers where we you know the seniors get dressed up like they're going to from uh, they're just coming into one of our centers and they're doing a wellness activity and we have, you know, a DJ there and we have activities for them to, to engage in and partake it. Um, you follow, you go with one of our drivers, uh, who's picking up members across the city and transporting them to and from our, our centers. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing how important and impactful that driver is in the life of that individual. That's the driver who knows everything about that individual, where they last vacation, and they're creating an environment within the within the vans, um, as far as introducing one to the other, one will start singing. I mean, if you do a ride along, it's pretty impactful, but it starts with the kind of orchestrator of the, the, of the, of the, I wouldn't call it a production, but of the experience. Um, and it doesn't have to be someone on the human experience team to do that. It doesn't have to be me as someone in a leadership position to do that. It's someone at every level who's interfacing, sharing in that commitment. Um, and making sure that 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 that's seen and felt as as widely as possible. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Mark. I think, I think some of, and I heard this from a mentor of mine. Some of the the best leaders mm-hmm. in the world are servants first, and I think you're you're a, a true example of what that means. And I, I can't help but 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 realize it and see, especially as I just hear you talking about, you know, the love and care that you have and the passion you have for, you know, your patients and your customers and your team members and your team. I, I can't help but realize and just congratulate you on that because I feel like it's so refreshing to, to to live in a world, especially with the way social media is and the way certain individuals might be highlighted for some acc- accolades and accomplishments. And that's all great. But, you know, in, in, in retrospect, the real leaders that may not have all the recognition are the ones that really are making the difference and are servants first and are putting their team members first. Um, because a leader, that's that's really what their job is, right? Obviously, they're you know, there comes some responsibility with making decisions and all these things, but you're there for your team. You're there for your employees. You're there for your patients. So um, I can't help but but say that about you. And I think that all of our listeners can adopt and really take so many things out of this episode from what you're saying um, and apply them to their own life because, you know, you're in a leadership position that you've taken risk. You you know, you've taken so many different, um, you know, hits, if you will, to to moving to different states and different cities and different opportunities where you could have very well said no. You could have stayed comfortable, like you mentioned, here in Miami where you're born and raised, lived a comfortable life and and had a good career, but you decided to go against the wind and and really take that risk. So I I applaud you for that. And Anthony and I usually say like, you don't need to be an entrepreneur. You don't need to be a CEO or an owner of a business to have an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, Anthony and I, I think is, and you as well, being an athlete, there's something different for some reason. I feel like when you when you've had that experience of being an athlete, a team player, you know, com- comp- competing basically like with with yourself, with other people, there's a different mentality and there's a different um, experience that goes on. And I think that you never lose that along your career. You may have you know not played basketball in ten years, but that mentality, that competitiveness, has still been instilled into your veins, into your blood, and into who you are. So I think that's such a huge uh, deal. And I think that a lot of our listeners and Anthony and I as well can take so much out of this episode. No, I so appreciate thank you again for coming on. And this was, this was such a blessing. I appreciate that. And I'll, I'll leave you with, with kind of the last thought, which is because you mentioned leadership and servant leadership. That is the only leadership model that works. That is, that is leadership. Uh, there is no it, anyone can be a boss. Anyone can be given a responsibility of whatever it entails. Um, not everyone is a leader. Sure. Every leader isn't a boss. Not every boss is a leader. You could be a leader and have no functional oversight over anyone in the organization. When I started at FedEx, I was an analyst. Um, that, that doesn't mean I can't be a leader. Um, leading up and leading down and managing up and managing down and holding people accountable and telling folks around you, hold me accountable. I need to be accountable to you as much as you need to be accountable to me. We're accountable to each other. Um, so it's not a title thing. I don't, I, I try to, I'm, I'm very sensitive to use to what words I use to describe my role in relation to a reporting structure. I, I never yeah. say, or I try not to say, my team it's not my team it's our team um okay. try not to highlight who functionally reports to me that to me that's not at the end of the day i'm going to be asked to make some difficult calls and i'm going to make them but i don't need to remind someone of my title to be a leader uh so i would again encourage as many folks that that chime in and and you know listen uh, and in your network as much as you can spread the word what you guys are doing is pretty powerful. Um, I hope that others learn from the experiences that you all are having and from these podcasts, but I would want to encourage other folks to do the same. Reach out to folks in your network. You reached out through LinkedIn because we, you friend request, whatever LinkedIn requested me in there, yeah. you know, I accepted and then you reached out. Um, and, and especially, and I can tell you, I'm, I get bar- bombarded with LinkedIn notifications, asking for sales opportunities and all this kind of stuff. And there I, I seldom respond because it's just impossible. But when it comes to anything that reminds me, that makes me nostalgic of what it was like for me not that long ago, yeah. trying to figure it out um, and reminding myself that it was people in positions 
that I aspired to be like, who gave me the opportunity, not the career opportunity, but the opportunity to just listen and provide guidance that then materialized into a career. I mean, that's really how it happened. If you want to kind of distill it down, that's how my career unfolded. Um, I would encourage folks to take that opportunity. You're asking someone for an ear, you're asking for guidance, you're asking for uh, insight. Uh, you're not asking them to buy your house. Uh, right. You're asking to learn from them. There are many people that will say no to that. Yeah. And thank you so much for, for coming on and, and sharing your story, Mark. You know, it's important that we highlight uh, your journey to success because a lot of us can relate to it. Uh, and if we can't right now soon, I'm sure we will with, uh, you know, the, the story that you're writing and that we all aspire to write ourselves or our, our own story, but modeling after people like you who are doing such great things uh, in, in really every industry. So uh, thanks for coming on. And, you know, before we leave, we have to do the Gator Chomp to let people know what's <laughs> up out there, right? Well, you know, I, I, don't, do I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to say this now that you're sitting in Gainesville, but I will. I love my University of Florida Gators, but I'm a cane. Always have been, always will be. Luckily, Gabe is a panther. And I'm a panther. <laughs> we, so. Amen. But, um, but I'm I'm a cane by choice. Yeah. So yeah. I've, I'll go to games and put sit in the student center. Amen. But so. Mark, where can our listeners find you if they want to reach out to you or consume your content? So I uh, consume my content. Um, my content could be best consumed on LinkedIn for now. I, I don't. I, <laughs> there is no content other than whatever's posted or whatever I post. Um, so they can, anyone can reach out on LinkedIn and, and again, to the extent that, you know, I can, I'd be more than happy to ha happy to help, uh, uh, guide, provide insight or what have you. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming awesome. on, Mark. We appreciate your time. Thank you guys. Thanks for having me.